Good afternoon, members, and it's time for questions to the Minister of Finance and Personnel. And I call Mr. Mike Nesbitt. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Question one. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, the work of the Strategic Policy and Reform Directorate is very wide and varied. The Directorate comprises of four divisions. Some of the key work areas recently progressed include preparations for the transfer of corporation tax powers to the Northern Ireland Assembly from April 2018, the finalisation of the OECD review, a review of the non-domestic rating system, the implementation of Piece 4 and Interreg 5A, and leading on the public section reform, including a delivery of innovation labs and the implementation of the cross-cutting review programme. And I, I, I thank the Minister and note the wide and varied uh, range of activity by the Strategic Policy and Reform Directorate. As the Minister will be aware, it's proposed that the new Executive Office will have a Strategic Policy and Innovation Unit. Can he inform the House where he sees the difference and ensure there will be no overlap? Well, I thank the Member for his question. I think he, he raises a very valid question and certainly it's something that since I came into post uh, when I was making myself aware of all the various elements that we have in relation to the reform division. It is wide and it is varied. In fact, I just uh, got some information in relation, for example, of the cross-cutting reform programme and the summary of uh, projects that are involved in relation to that. I'll be quite happy to share it with uh, the member. And I think that what needs to be done uh, in the work that's going on in terms of this division and the new executive is the point that he makes is that there is no duplication and that they are working together for the same objective. And what is that objective? It is about ensuring that we do have a streamlined system and that in terms of the delivery of public services across a range of issues, they are done in a way which is efficient and effective and gives us the best possible value for money. On. Can I just inform members that questions 7 and 15 have been withdrawn? And I call Mr. Danny Kennedy. Question number two, Mr. Speaker. The report of the review of financial processes in Northern Ireland has not been discussed by the executive. Without the executive's agreement, the proposal that it contains cannot be implemented. And of course, one of the proposals in the paper related to the departmental structures and with the move to the nine new department structure, this will have to then be revisited. I'm grateful to the Minister for his uh, initial response, but uh, he will know that it is now over six years since the report uh, was forwarded to the Executive for action. And surely, by any uh, standard, uh, uh, action should now have been taken to improve a very cumbersome uh, system which does not provide read across and proper accountability. And what, what steps uh, is the Minister prepared to outline? Um, he has indicated with the, with the new number of departments that there may be some changes. But change is necessary in respect of this for proper accountability. Uh, and, uh, and it is something I think that the entire House would be anxious to see. Uh, I thank the member for supplementary and indeed when this House debated uh, the Committee for Finance and Personnel motion on the review of the financial process some time ago, there was widespread support for the overall review of the, or the aims of the review as the member has alluded to. This also included members from all the main political parties in this House. And so therefore, in terms of uh, the way in which we move this issue forward, some of it has been superseded by the creation of the new nine departments. However, uh, as we have discussed even during the process in relation to the budget, I want to see uh, in my time in office, and I trust it would be the same for uh, my predecessor, that it is uh, that we have in this assembly a budgetary process, a financial process that is fit for purpose, that gives us an overall view of what is going on within each of the departments in a way that gives us, as I said to the member who asked the first question, uh, efficiency and effective delivery of government. 
when I came into post, this was an issue that I was made aware of that had been around, as the uh, member has rightly said, for a number of years. I would like to see progress in relation to it, but I have to now re-evaluate what has been done to date and to see how best we can, if it's necessary, salvage many of the, the points that were raised when this was first uh, brought to the floor of this Assembly. Mr. Concorda, and I, I share the sentiments expressed by my neighbour, Mr. Kennedy, in his uh, supplementary question. Uh, I think it is widely accepted that we have a convoluted and complicated, unnecessarily so, uh, budgetary process here. And now, uh, I think the minister seems, seems to be sharing that, that sense that things can be improved on. Now that we have uh, moved through to the nine departments, and that, if that was an obstacle at all, it is out of the way. Uh, can he perhaps consider giving us some time frame for when there will be a very serious look at the budgetary process and let us get a, a streamlined one, and one which the members themselves can engage more readily in than the unnecessary convoluted one we have at the moment? Yeah, thank the member, and obviously that will not only require uh, myself as the Finance Minister, but also require members in this House and also the parties and the executive to take that collective responsibility so that when, uh, if the paper was to be uh, put back into the executive, that it would be given the due consideration that I believe it deserves. However, before that would happen, I would take the view that we need to look again at it to see how it can be refined, to see how we can give uh, the, the assurance or, or the, at least uh, the commitment that we are creating uh, what is a, a process which is transparent, gives us that accountability and actually delivers for us in the way that we have intended. I also have to say that we are in a position where I do not want to in any way uh, bring forward something that uh, ministers in the new executive feel that is an interference, because I think that that was one of the issues that may have been uh, maybe to the fore in the past. However, I think that ministers who come to the executive table and ministers who will be at the executive table uh, should come with the attitude that we need to change the processes that we have, that we need to have more transparency across all the departments around how those financial processes are operating. And I think that will give great confidence not only to this House, but more importantly to the people who elect us to serve in this chamber. And Mr. Robin McGuinness. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And I, I note what the um, what the minister has said, and I also note the neighbourliness between Mr. Murphy and Mr. Kennedy. And long may that reign. Um, uh, but could could I ask the minister in relation to the the current uh, financial uh, process? Uh, he talks about uh, transparency. I don't see that much transparency. I see a lot of opaqueness. Uh, and uh, having, having been here for 18 years, I would like to see an improvement of that. Can the minister guarantee that? Uh, there, there are some who would maybe say that the member should go to Specsavers then, and he may be able to uh, have a bit more transparency. However, maybe our uh, budgetary process is a bit like the advert uh, when uh, the, the person who is responsible for clipping the sheep ends up uh, actually clipping the dogs as opposed to the sheep. However, I, I, I do agree, and I genuinely take the point when, when I saw this question uh, being uh, when it was tabled. It does raise serious issues around the entire process that we use. It has been raised, as I said, in terms of the budgetary process. I came into post four weeks ago, and it is extremely challenging the way in which we have to work through the budgetary process as well as having all the arrangements in regards to the financial situation. I would say this, however, that much of that as well is also governed, of course, by the rules of Treasury. And, of course, uh, I always want to ensure that I, I tread carefully when it comes to the issue of dealing with the Treasury. And, of course, your colleague uh, from uh, West Belfast always reminded me when I was in DSD that I was an employee of DWP, and I'm sure I wouldn't want to be accused of being now a member or associated with uh, the Treasury in London. But the, the serious point is this. I believe now is the time for us to look at how we can make uh, improvements, but it will depend upon the commitment of all of those parties who will be in the executive post the election on the 5th of May. Thank you. 
call Mrs. Pam Cameron. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Question number three. Thank the member for her question. And in terms of support for uh, social and affordable housing, the Department for Social uh, Development planned to deliver some 1,500 social homes in this financial year at a cost to the public purse of £101 million. This funding is expected to lever in around £80 million of private sector funding. Also, support for affordable homes is provided primarily through the co ownership scheme, with £95 million. Uh, points of uh, FTC capital being allocated in this financial year, expected to support up to 700 homes in the next uh, four years. Uh, as a member will be aware, my officials are currently in the process of establishing an investment fund. The overall aim of the proposed fund is to promote investment, economic growth uh, and jobs in Northern Ireland. And the fund will seek to address access to finance markets uh, where there has been failure. And it's also expected that the initial focus of the fund will be on urban regeneration projects, including grade A property, but energy efficiency and housing projects are also under consideration. Okay, and Mrs Cameron for a supplementary. Thank you, Mr Speaker, and thank the Minister for his answer thus far. Can he state if the Northern Ireland Investment Fund will support um, the, the, uh, both office and private housing um, development? Yes, I think that uh, in terms of the way in which we envisage how this will be rolled out, uh, obviously, the member will be aware that when I was uh, in DSD, I gave a commitment to ensuring that we kept our focus very clearly and very specifically on the benefits that we would generate as a result of housing. Indeed, I was uh, at the all-party working group uh, in relation to construction today, and I reiterated my personal view, uh, and I think it needs to become a collective view of this Assembly, that if we could unlock the potential that there is in relation to housing right across Northern Ireland, both in the social housing and also in the private sector, we would make an invaluable contribution to our communities. We would make an invaluable contribution to the construction sector. And in terms of the investment fund, the support for private uh, housing, housing is still under consideration in the context that the executive is already providing significant support through the Department of Social Development, Social and Affordable Housing Schemes. And the call, Mr. Uh, can the minister tell us uh, what steps he's taken to protect subcontractors involved in uh, public, public sector contracts, especially those uh, working on projects that don't fall within the project bank account range? Gormagot. Thank the member for his uh, question. And obviously, my department has, in consultation with the construction industry through the Construction Industry Forum for Northern Ireland implemented a range of measures that promotes access for small medium uh, government opportunities. Uh, these include uh, breaking larger contracts into lots to bring them within the scope of smaller businesses, uh, requiring contracts which have a value above the EU threshold to have a procurement strategy which includes engagement with the supply base, increasing the opportunities for uh, SMEs to bid for government contracts by setting proportionate minimum standards and accommodation applications for consortia. Those are a number of things. I take the point that the member makes. I think that we always need to, as I reiterated this point today at the all-party working group, there is always more that we can do. I think that the focus needs to rem uh, remain that in terms of legislation, in terms of EU rules, in terms of uh, all the other uh, suite of uh, legislation that we have for this sector, that we try to make it as simple as we possibly can, recognising the challenges that there are out there, because undoubtedly the construction industry, as we know, has seen over the last number of years, because of the downturn, a particular challenge, and it is not my place, nor, should I, nor do I think it is the place of government to put any more impediments in their way. Rather, we need to continue to work with them and get positive outcomes that helps to sustain and grow what is a vitally important industry for Northern Ireland. Call Mr. John Dalek. Uh, the, uh, the Minister's commitment to, to housing, both in his previous post and in his present post. 
and I wonder, is he in a, a position to uh, uh, give us an outline of the extent of departmental assistance to those wanting to avail of the Help to Buy scheme in 2015-16? I thank the member for uh, his question. Obviously, there are a number of, of schemes, and for example, uh, I was very uh, keen, and I almost sound as though I have resorted to type here, uh, as though I'm now the Minister for Social Development again. However, if you look at the issue in relation to co-ownership, uh, we used FTC money extensively around supporting that particular sector because I think that that was the right thing to do. It was the, it was the right financial vehicle that we were able to use. I would, uh, however, reiterate the concern that I have, and that really follows on from the Office of National Statistics, given what has happened uh, in the mainland around the issue of reclassification. I think that will bring a particular challenge uh, to bear over the next number of months, as I believe it is the intention of ONS to come to Northern Ireland first, uh, as the first protocol looking at the devolved regions. And clearly, I will want, along with my colleague Lord Morrow, to deal uh, sensitively with that issue. But that is a reality that we're going to have to face, amongst many others, when it comes to the challenging environment that housing brings in Northern Ireland. And I call Mr. Alistair Patterson. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I thank the Minister for his responses so far. As someone who does come from the construction background, it's good to hear the comments that we will give the help and assistance that we need to the construction sector. Can I ask the, the Minister, and um, I understand that financial transaction capital has been included in the budget for the purposes of the housing sector. Can the Minister advise if this option is more favourable than the use of conventional capital for new house building? Well, I think that when you come to looking at what's available for us in terms of uh, financial resource, there will always be a challenge for us in this executive and in this assembly around maximising the best possible outcome for what is available. Uh, clearly, FTC has come at a time when I believe we were able to capitalise and we were able to use it. The, the issue in relation to the investment fund and the work that we are doing with the European Bank to have that fund established, which will give us somewhere in the region of £100 million, which will specifically give, I believe, a focus around the, the, the delivery of a grade A property in cities like Belfast and in other parts of Northern Ireland. I think that those two financial tools, and they're not the only ones, and we shouldn't restrict ourselves solely to two particular funds. We need to be uh, innovative. We need to look at what else could we do. And I think, and the member was present uh, at the meeting uh, earlier on, I think that he, he heard the, the concerns that were being raised. We will continue to listen to the construction industry and to others to see if we have the right uh, models in place and what else could be done to help that particular sector. Thank you. And I call Mr. Gordon Lyons. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Question four. Thank the member for his question. The review of the non-domestic rating system consultation exercise officially closed on the 25th of January. The department did, however, allow respondents until the end of January with the final response accepted by uh, the 5th of February. The department considers the consultation process uh, to have gone well, with some 113 responses from organisations and individual ratepayers, pre uh, which present a good outcome in terms of the level of engagement. Uh, DFP officials have also participated in a series of events organised by NICVA, by NILGA and the Federation of Small Businesses. Officials have also held a number of individual meetings with key stakeholders throughout the consultation period. And the Department is currently compiling a consultation report summarising the responses and this report will be independently validated by the Economic Policy Centre at the University for Ulster. And at the moment, I'm reading my way through the responses. And if you saw a particular file that sits on my desk with uh, 113 various tabs on it, you'll know that that is my homework on a nightly basis. Okay. And I call, I call Mr. Lyons. 
Three marks is homework. <laughs> so I'll call Mr Lyons for a supplement. Thank you, uh, Mr Speaker, and we'll all be very glad to hear that the Minister is keeping himself uh, busy and that he has lots of uh, work to get on with. Um, Mr Speaker, charity shops play uh, a very important role um, in our uh, country. Um, however, uh, many will argue uh, that they dominate um, our high streets and main streets uh, across Northern Ireland. What steps, if any, can be taken to ensure that this imbalance uh, is addressed? I thank the member for uh, his question. I would say in relation to this issue, we have to deal with this issue in a sensitive way. And uh, I am well aware of correspondence that I have had. I am well aware of uh, lobbying that there has been. And when you come to this issue, uh, when you begin to change the rules that govern particularly the issue of, of rating, there is always the tendency to in some way go after one particular element that seems to be the easiest. However, my approach to this will be cautious, it will be fair, it will be what is equitable. And I think that I have listened to the concerns of other retailers who have undoubtedly said that there are uh, disparities, there are uh, differences there which need to be addressed. And uh, my uh, commitment to the House today is that this will be an issue that will be looked at, but in a way which is sensitive, given the nature of what it is we are particularly dealing with in relation to charity shops. Well, Ms. Claire Hanna. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and thank the Minister for his responses. And I'm glad you're enjoying the consultation um, responses. I've been reading some of them myself, and, and uh, one uh, disparity that people have noticed is the comparable rates bill for uh, businesses here and uh, comparable businesses uh, across the water in Scotland. Certainly, where many wouldn't pay rates at all, and in the Republic, where uh, a hotel, for example, might pay about a third of the rate they would here. Could I ask the Minister for his assessment of that differential and anything? that might be done uh, to support traders here? Well, I think that what we have to do in any decisions that we make in relation to uh, our system here is that we have it made to fit the, the circumstances in Northern Ireland. And while there are many occasions uh, it is right to look at other exemptions in other jurisdictions for certain reasons, I still think that we always need to remember that in Northern Ireland we are still uh, per head of uh, population in a better position in terms of the overall taxation of our people as opposed to other uh, parts of the United Kingdom. However, that brings us challenges because there are those who would argue that, that we should maybe increase that burden. My party has taken the view that we are a low taxation party and we want to find a way that again, and I underscore this, which is fair and it has to be fair. There are many who came out of the re-evaluation recently who did raise serious concerns about the way that that was done. Part of the reason for that was the, the long time that it took uh, for us to get to a re-evaluation. We have to now look, is three years the, the, the proper time? Is four years? So those are the things that are now uh, all part of the mix in terms of the way that we look at the issue of our rating system. And I will give serious thought to other uh, ways that it is done in other jurisdictions. But I make this caveat, it has to be suitable to what are the needs of the people of Northern Ireland. And Marcella Miller, had you indicated? Uh, Minister, it's, it's mid-term break, so there's no homework this week. That's, that's the good news. Uh, you mentioned the Ulster University Economic Policy Centre, and Neil Gibson was with the Enterprise Committee this morning. And he's very strong on the concept that derelict land should be taxed, should be rated, on the basis that that will spur economic regeneration. He used the example of Cross Gar, where I don't go often enough, but where there's an empty site in the centre of town which is uh, inhibiting economic development in other shops. I wonder if you're minded at this stage to give any direction to the incoming executive in relation to derelict sites in our, in our main streets and city centres. I yeah, thank the member, and he does raise a valid point around uh, how, we, how we tackle this particular issue. And I think we can all look uh, and all know of uh, locations in our own constituencies where there are particular problems. The difficulty we, we, we will face and the incoming executive will face is as soon as you would make a proposal to deal with that particular issue, 
there will be those who will be very inventive in finding a way around it. And I think that we have to then give a broader view as to the way in which that could be done so that we don't introduce a policy that has the right intent but ends up at an unintended consequence. And we've seen that in terms of the issue of vacant properties, where there are some who then went to extreme lengths to avoid the actual uh, revenue that they were due to pay on those particular properties. I think it is a valid point that's made. It should be given some uh, consideration. However, again, as I said, in relation to the issue it was raised, uh, particularly in relation to charity shows, we have to deal with it sensitively, and I think we will also have to deal with it wisely so that the intended policy is the actual outcome that we achieve. And I call Mr. Chris Hazard. Question number five. Thank the member for his question. And the Exemption from rates under the legislation would apply only to those parts valued uh, as sporting facilities and used by persons engaged in a prescribed recreation. This is set out in primary legislation and can't be adjusted through the new regulations which are being made by my department in this area. That principle applies both to the existing level of relief as well as to the proposed enhancement under my preferred policy for using the new enabling power within the new rates amendment bill. It has already been noted in changes with the, or exchanges with the committee that the term sports facilities in this regard is unlikely to include stands. There is an exemption to this general rule where areas other than sporting facilities make up less than 20% of the total NAV. In such cases, that element of the NAV will be treated as de minimis and relief will be awarded on this area. In very general terms, it would be rare for unlicensed clubs to exceed this threshold. These issues will be outlined in greater detail in the Department's forthcoming consultation in this particular area. Mr. Hazard for supplementary. I can call you and I thank the Minister for his answer uh, and look forward to the consultation. Does the Minister agree then that the, the, the cons consultation provides an opportunity perhaps to tackle, especially whenever so many uh, rural uh, clubs perhaps have these smaller stands that could be part of the, these changes? Gorm Yeah, I, I think that you know, members and I think maybe the general public always become very suspicious and sceptical of consultations because they believe we have a predetermined outcome and we are only really ticking the books. I have never, uh, certainly in the departments which I have had responsibility for, I have always believed that a consultation should be that. It should be about genuinely listening to what the views are and then evaluating what the response would be. But the consultation process will seek views on what I believe is my preferred policy in this area and will aim to address the gaps that occurred during the private members' bill uh, consultation process, because there were gaps, and that's what led us to, and the members well aware of the process that we had to engage in relation to that. Those gaps included seeking views from the wider section of the business community, such as the hospitality sector. Those strongly held views were largely omitted from the private members' bill consultation. And so I want to ensure that in this consultation, it is as wide as possible, it is as informed as possible, and then that will, I believe, give us the opportunity to ensure that we get the right outcome. Mr. Leslie Craig. The Minister will be aware that uh, spectator space is currently rated at present, uh, but certain sport clubs appear to enjoy rates relief despite the fact that they are licensed. Is this correct? Yes, there is, uh, there is some relief that is given. Indeed, the member will be glad to know that later on this afternoon I will be meeting with a variety of clubs and organisations who want to come specifically and talk to us around uh, this issue. As soon as you move uh, to look at a particular element of uh, the rating system, you can be absolutely sure, as the member knows of his colleagues in the pigeon fraternity, that uh, there becomes a gathering or a collective or a fluke uh, that comes to uh, circle you to say, well, what does this mean for us and why are we not included or why are we excluded? I want 
As I said to the member, I want to ensure that we listen to the consultation. I'm having a meeting this afternoon with a number of other clubs and federations, and uh, I will be able to give the member I trust a more informed uh, answer after I've had that meeting and also ultimately when we've had the responses in relation to the consultation. That brings us to the end of the period for listed questions, and we now move on to topicals. And I call Mr Declan Michael Lear. Um, uh, Minister, um, it was a very welcome announcement that during the, the Fresh Start Agreement recently, the day five was announced as a flagship project, and day 229 million has been allocated over the next number of years. Are you satisfied that there has been enough progress made on the, the legislative aspect of it to enable that spend to actually happen? I uh, thank the, the, the member for his, his question, and he is right. The Minister for Regional Development announced uh, the start of the consultations on the new draft statutory orders uh, and a new environment, uh, environmental statement for the A5 Western Transport Corridor dual carriageway scheme uh, just uh, a few days ago. And subject to successful completion of the statutory procedures, construction start work uh, is due to commence uh, next year on the £150, uh, £150 million pounds new buildings to north of Sturban section of the road. And I think that that is a clear indication. And, and this executive and this assembly has been criticised in the past about not making decisions. We are criticised when we make decisions. However, here is a clear example of a considerable degree of investment that is being made. We also have identified this particular route in relation to one of the flagships and that we have profiled the capital over the next number of years. Am I satisfied? There were, as a member will know, particular problems that were outside of our control. However, we now have given a commencement. We have now given, uh, I believe, the green light to this process. And I think it's evidence that when you have a DUP minister in charge of the roads, there's progress. I call Mr. Michael Lear for supplementary. <laughs> I thank the, the Minister for that answer. Um, no doubt the Minister will welcome the, 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 the proposal for the Land Acquisition Bill, but he made reference to the fact that the Phase 1 will cost in the region of £150 million, um, and that leaves a surplus end of £79 million. Could he tell me would that be envisaged to be used to commence some of the future phases? Well, I think what we have to do is we have to get the, the, the current uh, process underway. And Obviously, the Land and Property Service, and I wanted to, to place this on the record of the House because I think this is important and I'm quite happy to make this avail available to members. And that is that the Land and Property Service have published three very helpful booklets on the compensation in regard to domestic agriculture and other classes of property. These are available online via my department's website or in hard copies that can be obtained by contacting the LPS because I'm sure that the member, like other members in the, the locality, will be asked the questions around the issue, particularly in regards to compensation. It is an issue which uh, is associated with projects such as this, and I want to ensure, as having responsibility for the land uh, and property service, that this is done in an effective and an efficient way, and landowners' rights are protected under statute when property is vested and will receive full compensation for their loss based on the, princ the principles that are set out in those documents. So I would like and encourage members to be become aware of those, make them available to landowners in the area and to the general uh, public who has an interest in this issue, and I trust that we will continue to see progress on what is an important infrastructure project for Northern Ireland. Thank you, and I call Mr Ian McRae. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. As the Minister knows, this party is a, a low tax party. Therefore, can he give an update on the benefit to the industri industrial derating to the Northern Ireland businesses? I uh, thank the member for his question, and he's right, and I have already alluded to that in, in an earlier answer. But the member will also be aware that my predecessor previous, previously stated on a number of occasions that industrial derating will continue and that there are no plans to remove that support for manufacturing. That support provides a valuable boost to manufacturing, a sector that, while growing in Northern Ireland, has had been 
uh, had its particular problems and its particular difficulties in the past. And just so that uh, we can put it in some context, the relief is of the magnitude of uh, some 58 million per year, helping some 4,300 businesses per year and is already committed to in the 16-17 budget. Mr McRae for supplementary. Thank you and that's certainly welcome news and I, no doubt something that the, the business um, fraternity will be more, more than welcome. But can the Minister um, you know, give that assurance that um, whilst he has said it, that give 100% whilst maybe that's difficult, that there will be no um, changes to the industrial derating and that as this party, as I've said, is a low, um, <coughs> excuse me, low ta tax party, that that assurance will go forward into the new um, assembly term. Well, I'm glad it's a colleague that's asking the question uh, and not one of my political opponents. I can't say without fear or favour or contradiction that as far as we are concerned in relation to this uh, particular issue, it is my intention and I can confirm that there are no plans to remove the support which I see as key, uh, and I underestimate and underscore this, it is a key element of sustaining our manufacturing base in Northern Ireland. And I have no doubt that should there be any move uh, to remove that, there would be rightly opposition by many in the manufacturing sector. And I want to allay any concerns, any doubts, any fears. There is no plans in relation to the removal of that support. Thank you. And I call Mr George Robinson. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Mr Speaker, I know the Minister may have touched on my question, question one, but can the Minister list the flagship projects that received capital funding in the latest budget? Uh, thank the member for his question. And uh, Obviously, the, the budget uh, that was uh, and still currently going through this House uh, set out a number of uh, elements in relation to uh, spending plans for 2016 and 17. Uh, the nature of some of the capital projects means that it is important to provide uh, funding certainty to departments, and I think that that may have been an issue of concern in the past. The seven projects uh, and the amounts allocated over the five years are uh, £229 million pounds for the A5, £258 million pounds for the A6, £59 million for the Belfast Rabbit Transit uh, project, £122 million for the Belfast Transport Hub, uh, £243 million for the Mother and Children's Hospital, mm -hmm. Uh, uh, 79 million for the Desert Creek Training College and 91 million for the regional and sub regional stadia. And I think that gives uh, a clear commitment in relation to capital investment that this executive has been able to produce what is a plan and a very focused way in which this capital money will be spent. Mr. Robinson, a supplementary. Thank, Can you use thank them? Thank the Minister for his uh, answer. And could I ask him about the, the A6, uh, which will re reduce commuting times between East Londonderry and Belfast, and indeed eventually provide a much needed bypass for Dun for Dungiven. When would the Minister expect uh, that project to go ahead? Well, they say all politics is local. And uh, the, the two major elements of uh, this road project are planned to improve the A6, the Randallstown to Castle Dawson section and the London Derry to Dungiven section. The A6 Randallstown to Castle Dawson dueling scheme uh, is a significant project and will help remove a major bottleneck so improve the safety uh, and journey times on that strategically important route. In relation to the A6 London Derry to Dungiven section, which includes a bypass at Dungiven, it is well advanced in terms of development. It has been through a public inquiry and the inspector has produced a report embracing various recommendations. Uh, DRD has prepared a report addressing these recommendations and the Minister for DRD is currently considering them in full and will then take uh, a decision on how the scheme should proceed. Thank you. And I call Mr Paul Gervin. Thank you. Minister, I would just like uh, an update to the House in relation to the progress in setting up a fund to uh, distribute uh, the dormant bank accounts money. Could we maybe a, a progress report on that? Thank you, Member. And, and this is an issue that has been raised in the House in the past. And 
uh, it, it will change in terms of its name. It was originally the Dormant Accounts, but uh, it is now becoming more uh, the Community Finance Fund. Uh, and I think that that's the, the trajectory that we are currently setting ourselves. Just to inform the House and to inform the member, I've written to executive colleagues advising that I will, I will now publish a Northern Ireland Community Finance Fund. This fund uh, will utilise monies made available to Northern Ireland from the UK-wide Reclaim Fund and will be utilised and distributed as set out in the Dormant Bank and Building Society Accounts Act 2008. The intention to establish a fund was announced as part of the budget in 1516 under the working title of the Social Innovation Fund. Through the creation of a community finance fund, I believe that the Northern Ireland Executive can improve access to finance for a range of organisations across the third sector, including social enterprises, church groups and smaller community-based organisations to make further investment in their activities, grow their organisations and also, more importantly, become self-sustaining. This investment will enable such organisations to increase their relevance uh, and also increase their revenue and their capability of resource and increase the level of social benefit that they deliver to their communities. Thank you. Mr Gervin for a supplement. Thank the Minister for his answer. Uh, in relation to, to, to the information we have received, can we have maybe some timetable as to when we would expect to have some of these funds rolled out? Uh, well, as required, uh, Mr uh, Speaker, under the Dorma Bank and Building Societies Account Act 2008, my department will now direct the Big Lottery to develop a strategic plan for the utilisation of the funds in Northern Ireland. The strategic plan will be laid before the Assembly. The fund will be distributed by a third party appointed by the Big Lottery. However, it should be noted that the Dormant Accounts funding is separate and distinct from Big Lottery funding, and I would expect the fund to be operational by late 2016. I want to, I want to pick up that point in relation to the use of the Big Lottery. There are many organisations who in the past have felt that for right reasons that they could not uh, access lottery funding. Uh, this will be only administered through the way that has been set up nationally through the big lottery, but we will have a third party and that will give, I believe, confidence to many organisations that they now have an additional access to a funding stream and a funding source that in the past they may have felt that they could not access. Thank you. And question five has been uh, withdrawn within the appropriate time scale. I call Mr. Alban McGuinness. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Speaker. I wonder could the minister indicate if there has been any improvement in relation to unemployment figures in uh, my constituency of North Belfast? Yeah, I, I thank the member for his question, and obviously the issue of, of unemployment and the figures are always a particular challenge for us all. Uh, in this House. And we all have to uh, realise that uh, it is a challenge and uh, no, none of us know what uh, is the intention of organisations or companies in terms of the employment market. And there are many factors that uh, are brought to bear in relation to that issue. I recognise that North Belfast is an area where there are particular economic and, and social challenges. Uh, but I can say to the member that uh, the in terms of the numbers of individuals claiming unemployment benefit in North Belfast, it peaked at over 5,700 in February 13. However, over the last three years, there have been steady improvements in the local labour market, with the number of individuals claiming unemployment benefit there cut by almost half by the end of 2015, down some 42 per cent. And I think that that is. Uh, progress. I welcome that it is a, it's a positive uh, progress. However, we need to remain focused. We need to remain vigilant in relation to that particular issue. Okay, Mr. McGuinness, for supplement. Uh, can I thank the Minister for um, uh, that good news in relation to uh, unemployment in North Belfast? But we still have uh, a particular problem in relation to economic inactivity 
Uh, and would the minister have any uh, indications as to what level of economic inactivity is in North Belfast? Has there been improvement or what is the situation? I don't have the specific figures in relation to the numbers, but we're quite happy to provide them to the member. But what I will say in relation to that issue, uh, it is an issue that we have endeavoured to address uh, around a number of ways. One in particular, I think, is looking at the way in which we are able to uh, encourage the further and higher education to focus on the issue of skills. Uh, I committed an additional £20 million in relation to uh, ensuring that the issue of skills was looked at. I think that we need to continue to work with our education system. We need to continue to work with all the other government agencies in a, in a, a very coordinated way that does not allow what is a very challenging situation in regards to the overall figure for young people with, uh, who are neither in full-time employment or in training. We have to address that problem. Some steps have been taken, but I still think more progress needs to be made. Thank you very much, Minister. And that uh, is the end of uh, questions to finance and personnel. And